Okay. Currently, Dr. Allen serves as treasurer of the Zamorano Club of Los Angeles, the oldest bibliophilic organization in Southern California. She is a member of the Book Club of Washington. She has been chair of both the Rare Books and Manuscripts Standing Committee of the International Federation of Library Associations, IFLA, and the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of the American Library Association. She has also served on the Board of Visitors and Governors of St. John's College, she is also a member of the American Antiquarian Society, the Grolier Club, New York, the Book Club of California, and the Caxton Club of Chicago, our Renaissance woman. <laughs> she has spoken often and pursues research on history of the book topics, including colonial American almanacs, which we're gonna hear today. She teaches regularly at California Rare Book School and previously taught at Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. Dr. Allen received her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, a second master's from St. John's College in New Mexico, and her PhD from UCLA. On a personal note, Dr. Allen and I worked the last two years, starting September 2018, when I became the project manager of the California Rare Book School. She is one of the best humans and the best supervisor boss extraordinaire and I always tell her I hope when I get a job my supervisor would be as cool and would lead with your compassion wisdom and unmatched calm and coolness and I am very very grateful that you gave me this chance of two years working with you and knowing what a great great supervisor would be and join me to welcome our Speaker extraordinaire, Dr. Susan Allen. Take it away. I've got to eliminate the recording notification here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you everyone for coming. It's really nice to see everyone here tonight. Let me get started. Um, I hope that there'll be time for discussion and questions at, at the end. And I applaud you all for, for choosing this, at least for, for, the, for the time being over the, uh, over the convention that's going on. But I think that there'll be time for all of us to, to see some of that before the evening's over as well. So let me get started. At least two printed books could be found typically in the colonial American home. Um, let me let me get my um, PowerPoint up here too. Here we go. Take the almanac. The two books that could usually be found in colonial American homes were the Bible and the almanac. Since religion and by extension the Bible played such a major role in settling the colonies in North America, I like to think of the almanac as the other book. In my talk, I will focus on the other book and share with you some examples of what I have learned by collecting them and reading them. Information about the social fabric of the culture is embedded in them and we can, from them, we can glean information about contemporary life, including the ideas and predictions of the future circulating at the time about science and medicine, economics, government, and societal and cultural practices. While education and literacy were on the rise during the 18th century, both the Bible and the Almanac were read intensively rather than extensively. That is to say, both the texts of the Bible and the Almanac were read slowly and closely, word for word. Often they were read aloud. They were read for study and serious reflection. They were read and reread over and over again. This is the character of intensive reading. These texts did not lend themselves to extensive reading, which was more rapid, silence once through and often strictly for pleasure. In order to open a window on colonial American life, I ask you to join with me in some intensive reading of parts 
of a number of almanacs from my collection. I will do some reading aloud to accompany some of the images, and I hope from the images you will gain some sense of the physicality of these almanacs. They are small pamphlets printed on a single sheet of cheap paper, often used for the printing of newspapers as well. In the early 18th century, once printed on both sides with the almanac's text, this sheet of newsprint was folded and the folded edges were cut to produce eight, an eight leaf 16 page pamphlet. 12 pages were given over to the months of the year one for each beginning with January and ending with December, which left one page for a title page and three pages for additional information. Toward the end of the century, some almanacs contained more pages, but 12 were always dedicated to the months. The almanacs were not bound like books. Instead, their, their bindings were usually crudely hand sewn. They may have been sold unsewn and perhaps it was up to the purchaser to sew the leaves together. Some of the printing was not well inked or, or too well inked and many show the ravage of time. They are often fragile and worn, which of course we all would be if we were still around after 250 years. Unfortunately, digitally scanning almanacs in combination with these other factors makes them nearly illegible illegible in some cases. Before we look at images of almanacs, let me give you some context from which to view them. What is an almanac then? An almanac is a sort of astronomical cal calendar of the weeks and months of the year, providing the movements of the stars, giving the times of sunrises and sunsets, and predicting the weather and other matters. Molly McCarthy, an independent scholar who wrote Accidental Diaries, a History of the Daily Planner in America, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2013, has called them the first iPhone. The, the first almanac printed in America appeared in 1639. Since it was a calendar, colonists kept them handy. They were written for every man, and by that I mean men, women, and children. Typically, the household almanac was hung from a hoop of string by the hearth in the center of the colonial home, as evidenced by examples going well into the 18th century. Here we see a page for the gentleman, and here's a page for the ladies. And then we see here some information for the young reader, my young readers, he says. Here we see one with a loop from which to hang it from a peg by the hearth. Hanging there, this made the almanac accessible. Men and women, children, servants, and slaves all had access. If it were taken down for reading, it is likely that the reading would be allowed. Again, the read, reading would be heard by anyone in the vicinity in the household, men, women, children, servants, and slaves, including those who were illiterate. Furthermore, Olem, a French historian, has argued that, quote, the illiterate and semi-illiterate semi could use almanacs because they came, contained symbols and pictures. At the end of the old year, when a new almanac had been purchased for the coming year, the old almanac would be taken down from its peg by the hearth and it would be thrown into the fire and be destroyed. The new one would then be hung in its place. The passage of time, the lack of a binding, cheap paper, heavy use and burning at year's end would all have contributed to the destruction of 18th century almanacs, yet they survive still. Here's another one with a loop. And a third one with a loop for hanging. 
These pamphlets were never controversial. There is no evidence to make the argument that they were controversial. There is no record that any printer was censored for publishing an almanac. No one was arrested for printing an almanac. There is evidence to suggest that printers kept the type standing for their almanacs in order to print more copies when there were lulls in the printing office. Edition sizes were quite large. They are estimated at 15,000 copies per edition. For the production of this admirable necessity to public happiness, the printer tried to associate himself with some person skilled in mathematics who should be able to uh, compile annually an almanac for the local meridian. The fame of poor Richard, created by Benjamin Franklin, has been so great since the days of his first appearance that the layman thinks that his work as, com as com comprising the sum of colonial calendar making. Poor Robin, Abraham Witherwise, Theophilus Crew, John Warner, Benjamin West, Nathaniel Ames, Benjamin Benneker, who was the African-American scientist, and numerous other pseudonymous and undistinguished writers prepared almanacs of excellent quality for the printers of their communities to issue regularly in the fall of each year. There is evidence that beginning in, in the 1750s that at least one author's almanacs were extremely popular, leading to their being reprinted in multiple editions, and in some cases, pirated editions. Once we begin to see multiple printers at work producing one almanac and pirated editions, we can be sure that the particular our almanac reproduced so many times was the money maker for its author and for the printers. This brings us to the person named in the title of my talk, Nathaniel Ames, who lived from 1708 to 1764. He was a physician and innkeeper in Dedham, Massachusetts. He fathered Fisher Ames, the famous American statesman, orator, and political writer. Most importantly, he was author of the Astronomical Diary and Almanac, which was published annually for 38 years with a Boston, New England imprint. This remarkably long publishing run began in 1725 when he published the first for the year 1726. Following his death, another son, the third Nathaniel Ames, authored the almanac until 1775. Samuel Briggs, in his work, The Essays, Humor, and Poems of Nathaniel A. Ames, says, said, thus eight years before Benjamin Franklin had started his almanac, Nathaniel Ames was publishing one that had all the, the, its best qualities, fact and frolic, the wisdom of the preacher without his solemnity, terse sayings, shrewdness, wit, homily, wisdom, all sparkle in piquant phrase. He carried into the furthest wilderness of New England some of the best English literature, pronouncing there, perhaps for the first time, the names of Pope, Dryden, Butler, Milton, and repeating their, their choice fragments of what they had written. What is the content of an 18th century almanac? The almanac as calendar. While one does find literature in 18th century almanacs, as I noted above, the almanac is first and foremost a calendar, and every almanac has a page for each month of the year. Here we see June and July for 1737. These month pages are intimidating because they usually consist of columns filled with what at first seem like meaningless numbers. If you have ever set type, you will see immediately why a printer would leave the type standing for an almanac if there were any likelihood of a reprinting. Setting the type for such pages is time-consuming and tedious. 
If you study for a few minutes, the month pages shown here for June and July, you will see that the first and second columns list the day of the month and the day of the week. Let me see if I can use my cursor as a pointer to show you what I mean. If I can find it, oh, there we go. All right, so here we have the day of the month and then the day of the week. So you see the M for month and the W for week. The third column is the widest. It offers occasional weather predictions, thunder and rain, and more heat and more thunder. Historical trivia, King George II began to reign 1727. Scientific data, no high spring tides this month. Folk wisdom, dog days begin, and possibly political information such as court dates, the court of Hampton, court of Salem and Bristol, the artillery election in Boston. The fact, the last three columns are based on astronomical calculations. First, there's the rising and setting of the sun with a number for calculating the time of high time tide let's see if let's see if we can see that there would be there is an r for rising of the the sun and we see a little sun and then next to it and then sf for s rather for setting of the sun And then come the, fra the phases of the moon, followed by the hour of the rising and setting of the moon. And here you see the, the, the moon and the R for rising and S for, for setting. The almanac as literature and history. Essays, proverbs, aphorisms, and poetry in great abundance can be found in almanacs. Literary references are there to be deciphered by those with a classical education. Ames proudly presents a, the poetical accomplishments of a 12-year-old boy in 1751. Here we go, this is 1751, and this, he has a poem at the head of every month page. And this poem was written by a 12 year old boy. Chronologies of important historical events usually begin with the creation of the world. In 1745, this is given as 5,695 years ago. The Almanac as Guide to Good Health. During this period, many thought that the phases of the moon had an influence, usually positive, on various parts of the body. Look closely at the column directly under moon's phases. I'm going to have to go back to this slide right here. And you will see the words knee, legs, feet, head, neck, arms, and breath. Let me use my arrow, arrow again. If you, if you count, here we go. Knees, legs, feet, head, neck, arms, so forth. Now if we go to the, this slide and look at this page, we see the, the anatomy of man's body. This is 1729, and it, it's a, I have to say it's a facsimile. It's not from the, the original. I do not have a 1729 Ames Almanac. But let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hmm. 
Here we go. This one is from a, a slightly later almanac, 1734. All the body parts have a sign of the zodiac associated with them. An arrow points from the sign to the body part in the image. Notice what is lower, labeled with a lowercase m. Let me point that out for you. If I can get this arrow to cooperate for me. There we go. Here's the M, secrets. If you look closely at the image, you will see that those two, these two designate the private parts of the person represented. So if we come over here and get this to work. Here we go. Here's, here's the M and we see this arrow that's pointing this way between the legs of the image. Does the use of the word secrets reflect some Puritan modesty? Perhaps is the almanac giving guidance regarding the best day for sex? More intensive reading is necessary to answer this little riddle. The matter of temperance is taken up in the almanac for 1744. This is the, the, the cover of 1744. And the essay is on the left-hand side here. Uh, I, have, I have blown it up, but you see halfway down the page, it says courteous reader. This is a blow up, so I, you can see a little bit. So Dr. Ames addresses the courteous reader on the second page of this pamphlet. The matter, he says, the matter of tem you have often heard of the advantages, temporal and spiritual, that arise from temperance. And if you take notice of that divine poem writ by the best of English poets, i.e. Milton's Paradise Lost, notice the literary reference, after Adam's vision of diseases, a dreadful scene, the angel tells, tells that abs tells him that abstinence was the sole method of escape from the ruinous assault of those diseases and of obtaining long life. And then Ames continues, then believe me if I tell you that if you would enjoy health and stand a good chance of a long life, you ought to abstain from morning drams. How many youthful athletic constitutions have been ruined forever and the narrow span of human life contracted by two thirds of its breadth by unreasonable tippling in the forenoon. Indeed, there are some from consti some iron constitutions that can stand the force of their own extravagances, but how many wear out their constitutions before they arrive to 30 years of age and die as it were of old age in the very prime of life. He that can gain a habit of abstaining from strong drink in the forenoon is in but little danger of being drunk in the afternoon. I think that this is, shows us some of Ames' humor as well. He also has managed to slip into that reference to Milton uh, at the beginning of this little homily. He was well educated, and this is typical of his style. The almanac also teaches astronomy. On the very same page, we see Ames te teaching about astronomy. So I'm just going to go back and see at the head of that, that page the eclipses this year, 1744. There's, this is a list of eclipses that are going to occur in 1744. Ames predicts four, two of the sun and two of the moon. 
He gives the precise dates and approximate times of these events, but he says they will be invisible. I assume that means they will not be seen from the meridian of Boston in New England. Following this list, he tells us that the planet Venus is the morning star until August 9th, and that it, and that it will be the evening star to the end of the year after that. Another nice bit of astron astronomical science appears in the Ames Almanac for 1737. Let me see if I've got those here. Yes, but it's really illegible. The last leaf contains a two page essay addressed to kind reader. It begins, you may remember that in the year 1734, I answered objections against the Copernican hypothesis. And in the year 1735, I argued the similitudes of the planets to this earth and the probability of their being inhabited with creatures in like manner to this earth. He goes on to give how things would appear to an eye in each planet and discusses Mercury, Venus, or excuse me, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and Earth's moon. He concludes, Mr. Durham asserts that there is mountains, rivers, and seas in the moon, and others deny it. I cannot tell, but if I had the machine of the little Spaniard who flew thither, I would go and see. I should see the earth turn upon itself. I should have the pleasure of viewing all the seas and continents on earth, even those that lie near the poles, yet unknown and undiscovered by us. What a glimpse into the future. I think the quote unquote machine of the little Spaniard refers to Domingo Gonzalez, the hero of the 17th century book by Francis Godwin entitled The Man in the Moon or A Discourse of a Voyage Thither by Domenico Gonzalez. Gonzalez manages to harness a team of wild swans to fly around the world and ultimately to make a 12 day flight to the moon. Once there, Gonzalez spends six months with the inhabitants of the moon, only returning to earth due to homesickness. Published in London in 1638, The Man in the Moon is now seen as an early work of science fiction. We find an image of a solar eclipse in the Almanac for 1752. Here's the for 1752. Here's the eclipse. Uh, this is the moon covering the, the face of the sun. And you see the sun with his eyes. And the sun is a he. I'm not sure why. There's, there's a slightly better, slightly better view. It is also in this same almanac, the 1752 almanac, that we learn about the change in the calendar made by act of the British Parliament. See the note at the bottom of the page, right down below the eclipse. Here we go. And the note says, when this almanac was sent to the press, I had no certain account of the act of parliament reducing the year to new style. By 1753, we get a full explanation of the change from the Julian calendar or old style, abbreviated OS, to the new style. So here's 1753 and here we, here we get uh, the explanation. Uh, 
ever the teacher, Ames says, since this is the second year corrected in solar time and the general date of all Europe and almost all the almanac writers for last year and their several performances gave some account of this matter, I should have only confirmed to the act of parliament without saying anything further, but for the sake of many that take my almanac and have not seen or heard what has been said by others, I shall attempt to give them the reasons. The main intention in striking off the 11 days between the 2nd of September and the 14th of September, 1752, is to produce a, uniform, a uniformity in computation of time throughout the Christian part of the, the world. He continues by noting the inconveniences caused by this change, birthdays and payment of debts especially. Having anticipated these problems, he has inserted a fourth column in his table for each month, giving the date. I think that would have been back on the previous slide and let's see if we can see here yes you see the old s for old style and this is a, a new column that he's he's put in right right here and let's see if we see it here Yes, here we see old style again, and we see this added. The Almanac as a political tract. As we have seen, the Almanac was a calendar. It was a guide to good health, <clears throat> and it was a tool to teach astronomy. It was also a non-controversial political tract. As I noted earlier, to my knowledge, no Almanac was ever censored and no Almanac writer was ever imprisoned over content, yet radical ideas can be found in the content. For example, Ames would under interline humor in more serious phrases in the third and wider column of his month pages. Some of these lines were prover proverbs, but others, in retrospect, seem like political commentary. In 1742, Sorry here. In 1742, he wrote, Law and Liberty Strongly Urged. And in 1743, The Truth Appears Plain by the Liberty of the Press. And in 1745, In 1743, rather, or 40, 48, he writes, rum, sugar, tobacco, tea, lemons, and limes. How excessively used these later times. And in 1750, some liberty, but oh, where is property? In 1758, and that's the one you're looking at now on the screen, 10 years before the Stamp Act debacle, and 18 years before the first shots were fired in the American Revolution, we find Britain, oh, let us give one dire blow before you let your injured hands go. And let us awake, our all's at stake. And also, a union council and affection in the common cause will produce good effects, but discord and disaffection ends in disappointment. This copy that I've got in front of you shows an, or an owner who has scratched a manacle in the margin to signify the importance of this passage. Let's see if I can get here. Arrow, and there's there's the manacle. We also learn about somebody's cow, but um, I think the important thing was the pointing to this, the uh, common common cause quotation right right here.
let's let's look at the almanac for 1758 more closely for many years Ames went to to one printer John Draper of Boston and let's see you these are both yes what you're looking at is two covers two John Draper imprints Draper had been the sole printer of the Ames Almanac in 1751, 52, and 53. New Haven in the colony of Connecticut in 1754 and 1755. And in 1756, Daniel Fowle, New Hampshire's first printer, joined the other two. Since Fowle moved from Boston to Portsmouth in the summer of 1756, it is likely that the Ames Almanac he printed that fall for the year 1757 was one of the first New Hampshire imprints. The next year, the 1758 Almanac was brought out in no less than five or six editions. One could say it was a bestseller. One of two editions were printed by John Draper in Boston. One was by Eadson Gill, also of Boston. One was by James Parker, in Connecticut, one was by Daniel Fowle in New Hampshire, and a sixth was brought out by Timothy Green, also of Connecticut, New London, Connecticut. At least one of the two of these editions may have been pirated. Since the probable edition size was about 15,000 copies, there could have been as many as 90,000 copies of this one particular almanac circulating in the colonies. Clearly, the popularity of the Ames Almanac was growing and colonial printers gravitated to it looking for commercial success. By 1765, four of the five printing firms, Draper, Eadson Gill, Green, and Fowle were still in business and all four published newspapers. John Draper, who died in 1762, brought his son and his nephew into the business before his death and the firm continued with great financial success as Draper and Draper. Eadson Gill was also a great financial success. While Green and Fowle continued in business, they were less well, well off financially. So being known as a printer of the Ames Almanac did not necessarily guarantee success. In 1759, nine printers brought out editions for Ames, and by 1760, there were as many as 13 printers for a possible total of more than 195,000 copies of Ames Almanac in circulation that particular year. Turning back to the 1758 Almanac, let me show you four different covers or title pages. Unfortunately, I lack the editions printed by James Parker, Timothy Green, and Daniel Fowle, but I have one with no printer name, so it may be one of the pirated editions. Once we have looked at the covers, we will look at some of the content. It will help you to see why this year, 1758, may have been a turning point in popularity for the Ames Almanac. I like to call it the subversive almanac. So we have two Draper imprints here, and I just want to point something out. Um, this T uh, is clearly not the same T that we see here. So one of two things may have happened. Um, either the T became damaged, and so it was replaced uh, by a different type sort. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go back. There we go. Um, and it was replaced by a different type sort, or it may have been a completely fresh setting of type because the almanac was so popular. But at any rate, you can see, I think, pretty clearly that the T has, has been replaced. Both say J. Draper for the booksellers. So it was being sold in multiple locations. You can look down below. Oh, well, we see it very clearly here, Boston, New England, printed by J. Draper for the booksellers. This is the one with the, the nicer looking tea. So it was 
it wasn't just being sold at the at the at the printers. It was being sold by booksellers around uh, Boston and probably other places in, in New England. Uh, let me keep going here. We've got the Eads and Gill imprint on the left. They were, they were printed and selling it in Boston. And the one on the right gives the place of pu publication as New England and indicates it was printed for the booksellers again, and it's smaller in size. So it's possible they were both pirated. So you can see there are definitely differences between these two and the Jay Draper ones that we looked at. If we look beyond the covers in all these copies, we find at the end the same two-page e essay written by Nathaniel Ames. The title of this essay is A Thought Upon the Past, Present, and Future State of North America, and it starts, it consists of an introductory sentence followed by three paragraphs. Let me read an excerpt of the words Nathaniel wrote, Nathaniel Ames wrote so long ago. America is a subject which daily becomes more and more interesting. A writer, and here he's probably referring to Benjamin Franklin, upon this present time says that fertile country to the west of the Appalachian Mountains between Canada and the Mississippi as of larger extent than all France, Germany, and Poland, and all well provided with rivers, a very fine wholesome air, a rich soil capable of producing food, and all things necessary for the convenience and delight of life in, in fine, the garden of the world. Have we not too fondly numbers? Our numbers will not avail till the colonies are united, for whilst divided, the strength of the inhabitants is broken. If we do not join heart and hand in the common cause against our exulting foes, but fall to disputing amongst ourselves, it may really happen, as the governor of Pennsylvania has told his assembly, we shall have no privilege to dispute about, nor country to dispute in. He continues, the future state of North America. Here we find a vast stock of proper materials for the art and ingenuity of man to work, work upon. So arts and sciences will change, change the face of nature in their tour from hence over the Appalachian Mountains to the West Ocean. Huge mountains of iron ore are already discovered and vast stores are reserved for future generations. This metal more useful than gold and so silver will, will employ millions of hands. Shall not those vast quarries that teem with mechanic stone, those for structure be piled into great cities? O oh, ye unborn inhabitants of America, should this page pace should this page escape its destined conflagration at the year's end, and these alphabetical later, letters remain legible when your eyes behold the sun after he has rolled the seasons round for two or three centuries more, you will know that in Anno Domini 1758, we dreamed of your times and it's signed Nathaniel Ames. By close reading, that is intensive reading of 18th century almanacs, a picture of contemporary life emerges. First, we can see what the po political issues of the day were, war, expansion, a growing sense of independence from Britain among the colonists. If we read almanacs over time, we observe a transition from an agrarian society to a commercial one. We see an increase in the roads listed and courts, court sessions given. 
currency and rates of exchange are awarded more space. Second, we can see the promotion of certain ideas regarding science, health, education, economics, government, self-reliance, and societal and cultural practices. I liken this to what I call the Spock effect. Dr. Benjamin Spock, some of you will remember him, was a pediatrician who wrote the very popular Baby and Child Care. This book influenced several generations of parents in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s to be more flexible and affectionate toward their children. As the colonists moved closer to unification and independence from Britain, we can see the Ames effect at work. Ames made an effort to challenge and change some of the common behaviors and beliefs of his day. We see predictions. At the very simplest, we see the predictions of astrological events. From scientific calculations, the times of the rising and setting of the sun and moon are foretold. When eclipses will take place is made known. The anatomy of man of man's body predicts health and behavior. Even in this century, it is not surprising to hear someone suggest that the full moon has an impact on his or her emotional state. Weather is predicted, not just for days or weeks, but by months in advance. Even extraordinary human events, such as a union of the American colonies on the near term and space travel on the long term are imagined by Ames. Both the occurrence of multiple editions and pirated editions of almanacs give evidence of how colonial printers gravitated toward what was commercially successful. Printing newspapers and almanacs required a capital investment in equipment and paper, and sales of these publications combined with job printing supported their, own public, their other publications. Finally, the influence of some 18th century almanacs persisted and was felt well into the 19th century. Certainly, the ideas about self-sufficiency and self-government found in the almanacs fueled the American reservation, re Revolution. The Ames essay, America, written in 1757, is the earliest articulation that I have been able to find of manifest destiny, destiny a term coined in, in 1845. This appears to have been a commonly held idea before there were words for it. General George Washington is said to have, has, is, was asked, what will you do if you're defeated by the British? He answered, we will retire beyond the mountains and there be free. Since 90,000 copies of this America essay hung nearly possibly as many hearths for the year of 1758, I cannot help but think that this essay had an important impact on its readers at the time. In fact, history shows us that it had become an accepted opinion among the colonists. As I said at the onset, at the outset, information about so social fabric of colonial American culture is embedded in almanacs. The almanacs have survived for us to read intensively so that we may discover this social, social fabric anew. I can only see one of you with hands clapping, but I appreciate, I see more now, now that I got myself out of the, the screen here. Make some noise. Hi, Susan. Well, we can unmute, we can unmute it, un, unmute. <laughs> I can't talk anymore. I've got cotton in my mouth. <laughs> and I'm glad to answer questions if you have them. I'm sorry, I can't even see myself. So how the way we did it last two weeks that worked well